Thank you for the introduction. Uh, my name is uh, Chris Kiefer. I am an emergency physician uh, working in Toronto, and uh, I am the president of Canadians for Nuclear Energy. So I'm here in Ottawa to echo Ms., uh, Minister, uh, Deputy Prime Minister Christia Freeland's call to fast track energy and mining projects in order to supply our European allies in the worst energy crunch since the OPEC crisis. What I'm here to do is to argue that in so doing, we must center the lowest carbon technology that we have. We're a tier one nuclear nation, and we have some of the best technology and some of the best uranium deposits in the world. Canadian uranium is used in our domestic fleet and internationally and displaces 230 megatons of CO2 every year. That's equal to one third of Canada's total all sector emissions. There are opportunities for the government to get involved right now. Romania has four CANDU reactors. Two are finished. Two need to be finished. China was going to finance the Romanians in order to do this. The U.S. has stepped in and said they will finance it. This is a no-brainer. They will finance Canadian technology, stimulate our supply chains. But Canada has to be involved and has to invest in order that we can maximize Canadian content on that. Nuclear energy is a proven tool. Right here where we are in Ontario, six out of every 10 light bulbs in this room are powered with nuclear energy. Nuclear provided 90% of the energy required to phase out coal in this province. And that has been called North America's greatest greenhouse gas reduction. I'm an emergency physician. I see a lot of respiratory and cardiovascular disease in my department. I began practice at the beginning of the coal phase out and we went from 54 smog days a year in Toronto to zero every year, thanks to nuclear energy. So nuclear literally saves lives. I'm also here because there is serious contradiction within the government at this point, and they need to clarify their stance. On the one hand, their green bond framework lumps nuclear alongside tobacco, gambling, and firearms. Bond funding is essential to build the infrastructure that we require to meet the challenges of climate change. On the other hand, there has been some money sprinkled on the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission. Um, and due to our advocacy, I believe, particularly Canadians for Nuclear Energy, a petition that uh, Mr. Tokar uh, sponsored, um, we did see some movement to include nuclear within the Canada Infrastructure Bank mandate. So these are promising steps, but for the government, they need to go back to the time of Seamus O'Regan, who said, Canada, uh, said, can do nuclear is a gold standard reactor around the world. There is no net zero without nuclear. You know, the future <clears throat> in this country, as we reshore in the context of decoupling from China and a new geopolitical order, is gonna rely on skilled tradespeople, on blue collar workers. We need to build, we need to build rapidly. We need the equivalent of 96 new candy reactors across this country to double or triple the grid in order to pursue an electrify everything agenda. Currently, the federal environmental impact assessment is actually bad for the environment. The government of Canada has committed to uh, zero carbon electricity by 2035. It currently takes seven to nine years to license a new site for nuclear. And when I say new site, I'm not even meaning a non-nuclear site. Nuclear sites are some of the, have some of the best environmental monitoring in the whole world. The Inflation Reduction Act in the US fast tracks siting and environmental assessments, particularly for former coal sites. If you put clean energy on a coal site, your environmental impact assessment is fast tracked. This is the kind of bold action that is required in Canada in order for us to meet these emissions. And it's going to rely on something that's actually a limited resource. Demographically, our skilled trades are aging out and we have not respected working class people um, and elevated their position in society. So there are a number of limiting factors, a number of things that the government can do. But ultimately, this government has to choose between misguided environmentalists who are scoring climate own goals by shutting down nuclear plants or attempting to here or around the world. When nuclear plants close, they're always replaced by gas and coal. I'm very proud to say that my organization spearheaded the move to life extend and add 30 years of life to the Pickering nuclear station. 
And I really want to say this was a litmus test. If politicians are afraid to come forward, as Seamus O'Regan did several years ago, and be boldly pro-nuclear, they have to look no farther than the announcement of the Pickering Life Extension and Refurbishment, which my organization fought so hard for. Environmentalist groups are really without a good argument. Pollution Probe Environmental Defense didn't even issue a, a statement. The Ontario Clean Air Alliance, of course, opposed the life extension and refurbishment, which is very puzzling, given that nuclear energy produces no air pollution. But Asthma Canada came out in favour of the extension and refurbishment. In addition, skilled trades unions representing over 300,000 workers in Ontario have come out and backed the life extension and refurbishment. The Medical Isotope Council as well, obviously my organization. So nuclear contributes so much here domestically on, on emissions reductions, on clean air, <clears throat> on medical isotopes, and our European allies are crying out for Canada to step in. Cameco and Brookfield Renewables partners just uh, announced the purchase of Westinghouse. As we rightly boycott and sanction Russia for its atrocities in Ukraine, Canada has a huge opportunity. Russia is a major supplier of nuclear fuel to the global fleet. And, you know, our uranium industry should step in and fill that gap. Currently, again, our uranium uh, production offsets fully one third of all of Canada's all sector emissions because it displaces uh, natural gas and coal. If we produce even more, that's, that's going to be incredible. We might be able to displace half of our country's national emissions. Of course, that's not enough. We need to build more nuclear. We need to recreate the Ontario experience in other provinces, particularly on those coal sites where working class people there with good dignified jobs in those plants can have a just transition to even better jobs within the nuclear sector, as happened right here in Ontario. I'll wrap up my remarks there, but we're in very exciting times. Again, Christia Freeland calling for the fast tracking of energy and mining projects. We need to center nuclear technology in that plan. Christia Freeland also um, announcing that Canada is going to come up with its version of the Inflation Reduction Act, which involves enormous investments in clean energy technology in the US, notably including nuclear. Thank you very much uh, for your time and I'm uh, very pleased to take questions. We'll open the floor to mics. What role, if any, do you see a price on carbon helping um, or hurting the transition to, 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 to nuclear power. I mean, I guess the, the argument could be made that the price on carbon forces the economy and the market to choose low carbon solutions, and maybe nuclear would be among those solutions. Is there, does, does it play any role, you think? Let me give you an example uh, right here from Ontario. So our grid is almost entirely clean. We have a deeply decarbonized grid, the envy of the world. And we're gonna maintain that by keeping the Pickering nuclear station around. To get to your question though, our resources on the grid are nuclear, which underpins everything, 61%, hydro with about 20, 25%. We have a little bit of wind and solar, which unfortunately contributes very little because it produces out of phase with demand. And we have some natural gas, which we have to use mainly just for peaking right now, again, because that nuclear displaces it. The carbon tax as it applies right now only taxes about 10% of the emissions out of those natural gas plants because of the way that the, the, the legislation is set up. So that is no incentive to get the only real source of emitting electricity off of our grid. You know, so the way it's applied is very important. Um, you know, I, I, I'm a pan-partisan person. You know, I've, I've been speaking with the Liberals yesterday. I talked to Justin Trudeau, uh, Minister of Labour, uh, Seamus O'Regan. Um, you know, I'm, I've been making efforts to reach out to the NDP and the Green Party. Um, this is a real pan-partisan issue. Yes. Um, and carbon taxes, you know, may or may not be a part of that. Um, but what is most important is that we deploy the evidence-based solutions that we have. You know, we have run the world's biggest experiment with wind and solar in Germany. They've spent over 550 billion euros on a wind and solar dominant transition. Before the Russian invasion in 2021, the number one source of electricity on their grid was still coal. 
And that's gotten far worse uh, in this year as gas prices have gone through the roof, something like 10 times that that we have here in North America. So we phased out coal in Ontario. We know that nuclear works. The most important thing is that we choose the right technologies in order to pursue our decarbonization goals. So if a carbon tax contributes to that, you know, as it really should in Ontario, instead of exempting 90% of the emissions of our only source of emissions on the grid, great. Okay, but it's not being applied appropriately. And again, the fundamental thing is that we align our technological choices with our goals. If our goals is evidence-based deep decarbonization, if it's clean air, if it's medical isotopes, if it's high quality employment, if it's an economic multiplier effect of $1.40 returned on every $1 invested because the entire supply chain is right here in Canada, if, the, if we want energy security in an increasingly turbulent time, then nuclear is the choice we need. And as I've outlined a few concrete steps that can be taken, but immediately the federal government must include nuclear in the green bond and stop insulting the working class people um, who make this vital source of energy. So uh, just as it's applied, you would say the federal price on carbon does not help or encourage provinces, producers to, it, it, to it, switch it, to, to nuclear or to, to it's, not, it's not moving the market in that direction to the, low carbon options like nuclear. The emission cutoffs that have been set are to incent generally a coal to natural gas switch. And that's why they're set it that way, where the gas plants are only paying a trivial amount, a token amount, um, on their emissions. There's a far better choice. Coal is 1,000 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour. Natural gas is about 500. We're talking life cycle, the whole process. Nuclear, from the mine, the fuel manufacturing, the construction of the nuclear plants, the decommissioning, the fuel storage, is about 6 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour. That's insane, right? And this is, this is not me making up these numbers. This is the UN Economic Commission for Europe, which was tasked with investigating this in the EU sustainable finance taxonomy, which unlike Canada, includes nuclear energy. And you have South Korea, you know, uh, their new president just visited about a month ago. They've included nuclear in their green bond. If you were to take your finger out and put it up in the air and see which way the winds are blowing on nuclear, there's a hurricane out there. That's a bad reference when talking about climate change. But the winds are blowing strongly in favor of nuclear. Countries around the world are committing to it all across Europe. Even anti-nuclear stalwarts, uh, you know, where green parties, again, are scoring climate own goals by shutting down or attempting to shut down nuclear plants. Even Germany has decided to keep its three plants online, heeding the words of the world's foremost climate activist, Greta Thunberg who said, no, Germany should not be shifting back to coal. It has nuclear plants. It should keep running them. So we're seeing the winds of change blowing in terms of national decisions by governments. We're seeing a huge openness to nuclear from financial institutions. I was just over at the Canadian Nuclear Financing Conference right now listening to Mark Carney, the former governor of the Bank of Canada and Bank of England. Toronto Dominion Bank, Bank of Montreal, RBC have all issued reports which are very favorable to nuclear. The uh, green bond put out by Bruce Power was oversubscribed by seven times. You know, Minister Gilbo was celebrating that the green bond, the federal green bond, was oversubscribed by two or three times. Seven times oversubscription on the Bruce uh, green bond. This is telling us something. Canada, again, a tier one nuclear nation. We're the best equipped in the world right now. Uh, and the government of Ontario, in making this decision to extend and refurbish nuclear, is sending a very strong signal. So we have government support. We have the human factors. We have an incredibly skilled workforce that's teed up because of Canada's largest infrastructure project on the refurbishment of our Candus, giving them an extra 30, 40 years of life. We have a supply chain that is intimately familiar with our national nuclear technology, which is Candu. All we need is the financing to come into place, and this government has a critical role to play there. And frankly, this government risks losing seats in Ontario because of that disrespect for nuclear workers, for the skilled trades, you know, whose bread is buttered by these refurbishments and by this economic multiplier effect of a dollar forty returned on every single dollar invested in Candu. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Sorry for the long lecture. <laughs>